What comes to mind when you think of your childhood? I'm sure you think of your family, meals, or moments as a child. But what you probably also think of is what you saw on TV. Now I'll ask you another question. Can you imagine an icon of your childhood more important than Mickey Mouse? Although they may not have seen him or were more fanatical about other cartoons, it is undeniable that almost every child in the world knows who Mickey is. Like many other kids, I knew who Mickey was. I was his fan, and there was nothing I wanted more in the world than to meet him. What I didn't know was that Mickey wasn't real, and that behind Mickey's costume could be anyone. There could be a good person, there could be a bad person, or there could be a psychopath behind the friendly mouse's mask. And that's exactly what I encountered. It all started when I was 12 years old. Yes, I know, a little too old to be a Mickey fan. My classmates made fun of me for having so much Mickey stuff, but I didn't care. No matter how young I was, I always had a great sense of individuality, and no one was going to tell me what I liked or disliked. My parents used to take me to Disneyland, and I always took pictures with as many Mickeys as I could. I knew that wasn't the real Mickey, and that they were just teenagers working in costumes. But among them, maybe. Just maybe there was the real Mickey. Camouflaging himself among all the Disneyland employees, and if I tried hard enough to find out which one it was, maybe I would find him and he would congratulate me. Whenever I tried to get close to one of the Mickeys at Disneyland, my parents would push me away and tell me to leave them alone. I was a bit of a troublemaker and adventurous, so they were always watching me. Until one day, one day they couldn't watch me. They couldn't stop me from getting close to Mickey. Because Mickey was looking for me. That day I was coming home from school. My parents were working all day, so my grandfather would pick me up. We were walking back to my house when, out of nowhere, I saw Mickey walking towards us in the distance. He was coming behind us, and even though he was far away, I could recognize him. Who else would have those ears, that face, those clothes? I couldn't tell my grandfather as he would surely make us walk faster. He wasn't a big fan of Disney, and he hated everything about it. I tried to find an excuse to walk slower, tie my shoelaces, stop for a moment because I was tired, Say I had hurt my leg in gym class. Anything that would slow my grandfather down and make Mickey catch up. When I turned around again, I noticed that Mickey was much closer. Not only had I made a lot of time, but he was walking faster and faster coming in our direction. I remember for a moment getting excited. He was looking for me. He realized that I wanted to meet him. I ignored my father and ran towards him, but as my grandfather yelled at me, my steps became slower and slower at what I was seeing. That wasn't Mickey. That man was in a mouse costume. But that man wasn't just any man's costume. This Mickey costume? This costume was horrendous. It was totally squalid. He had a big smile, but his face was horrible. Like he was a version of Mickey that had aged a lot. The man in the Mickey costume was no old man. He ran and ran. He was getting closer and closer to me. I was paralyzed. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was expecting to see Mickey in front of me. And I saw him, but he looked like a Mickey out of hell. The man disguised as Mickey was about to catch me, but my grandfather got there before him and managed to save me in time. He's the one from the news. Run, run. Go home as fast as you can. Don't turn around. We're only two blocks away. Run now. Obeying my grandfather, I ran as fast as I could. I turned around, and as fast as I could, I ran. As I did, I heard my grandfather scream in pain. The man dressed as Mickey was probably doing something to him, but I didn't know what. I listened to my grandfather and didn't turn around. I just ran home. Once I got there, I tried to open the door, but it was locked. Behind me, I heard footsteps. When I turned around, I saw him again. It was Mickey, but something had changed. His body was full of blood, and in his hands, he was holding a huge knife. When our eyes met, he raised his hand, and with one finger, indicated me to go in his direction. I ignored him and went around my house, jumping over the fence and into the yard. The back door to my house was also locked, but I knew where the key was. My parents always left a key under a rock by the pool in case my grandfather or I got locked out. I ran to the pool and grabbed the key, but once I did, I ran back to the door and before I opened it, 
I saw him again. Mickey's head was peeking over the fence. On one side of his head, I could see the tip of the knife, and on the other side, his hand was timidly sticking out and waving at me. I got desperate and put the key in the door. As I entered, I could see how the man disguised as Mickey was slowly climbing the fence. He could have done it faster, but this man was purposely taking his time, making me feel like helpless prey. Once in my house, I locked the door and ran out there. When I finished locking the door, I noticed how the man was watching me from the small kitchen window. Without trying to enter, he watched my every move. With a wave of his hand, he asked me to open the door for him, and I ran as far as I could, hiding in my room and locking the door. During that moment, I could hear the man disguised as Mickey force the kitchen door open and enter. I tried to hide under the bed, but that's when being as young as I was at the time, I realized something that saved my life. When he came into my house, I had locked myself in with him. Sooner or later, he would surely find me. As I was thinking, I could hear the man knocking on my door. He knew I was there. Instead of hiding, I opened my bedroom window and escaped from the house as fast as I could. As I did so, I listened as the psychopath pounded violently on the door. Sooner or later, he would come in, but I would no longer be there. I ran to the neighbor's house across the street, and when he saw me terrified and crying, he immediately let me in. I told him everything that happened, but as soon as he heard that a man dressed as Mickey attacked my grandfather, he called the police immediately. My neighbor calmed me down and told me that everything would be okay, that the police were on their way, and that the man couldn't hurt me anymore. Alarmed by my neighbor, my parents arrived at my house, which was already swarming with police. They did not find the criminal in my house or anywhere nearby. Who they did find was my grandfather, lying lifeless on the sidewalk a few blocks away. Both my grandfather and my neighbor knew who the criminal was. In the last few days, a man had been killing people in different neighborhoods. The man was always disguised as Mickey. A few days later, the man was caught and arrested. He was found by chance sitting on the sidewalk, looking at the sky. The man did not resist or speak. He just let himself be arrested. His motives were never known, although I didn't care to know them either. Maybe as a kid, he was a Mickey fanatic like me, but for some reason, he had gone crazy, disguised himself as his idol, and started a senseless killing spree using his face. Hello, everyone. We are thrilled that you have been enjoying our videos. Your support means the world to us. If you've liked what you've seen, please consider liking and subscribing to our channel. We would love to hear which one of our videos is your favorite. We're on a mission to reach 100,000 members in the SSG family, and with your help, we can achieve that goal. Thank you for being a part of our journey. Do you have any stories with Mickey? To tell you the truth, I was never a big fan of Mickey, nor did I understand why there's so much fascination with him. As a kid, I preferred to watch other cartoons, and since I don't live in the United States, I never went to Disneyland. But you know, I still have a story with Mickey. Although, unlike many people who have happy stories with him, mine is absolutely terrifying. It all started with a crime. No one in the neighborhood saw our neighbors for weeks. They always left for work at 8 a.m. and went for walks on the weekends. But from one day to the next, no one else saw them. We thought that maybe they'd moved out, but all their stuff was still there. The car was in the house, and they never left without their car. After a while, my parents called the police, and they went in to check the house. They found the worst possible scenario. Everyone in the house was dead, cruelly murdered. As the murders had taken place a long time before, there was no trace of the criminals. The couple had no children, and their parents were too old to come see the house. There were other relatives who were going to come and see the house, but they couldn't come for at least a few months. So, for that period of time, the house was abandoned. At that time, I lived on the second floor of my house, and my window looked right into the window of the neighbor's room, where they were found dead. Sometimes I would look at the window, out of curiosity, hoping to find something. Other times I would see it by chance, simply turning my head as my eyes inspected the window. 
I don't know why I looked at the window that Thursday morning, but I wish I never had. As soon as my eyes stopped at the window, I saw someone standing in the neighbor's room. At first, I thought for sure some family member had arrived, but then I realized that it couldn't be any family member. It was a person disguised as Mickey, and he was looking right in my direction, waving at me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Was it a joke? A teenage prankster trying to scare me for no reason? Did he understand that he was standing in a place where just a few days before, there were two corpses? And why was he dressed as Mickey? As soon as I saw it, I ran to tell my parents, and they went upstairs and went into my room. But when they looked out the window, there was no one there. They quickly went downstairs and went to the neighbor's house, but no one seemed to have entered the house. The doors were still locked, the police tape intact, and the windows were completely secured. Naturally, my parents thought I had seen wrong, or that it was my imagination, especially since the neighbors would notice if someone disguised as Mickey had entered their neighbor's house. And so, just like that, they stopped believing me, and pretended I hadn't told them anything. For my part, I was sure of what I had seen. Although I still didn't notice anything suspicious, I just wondered where the man disguised as Mickey had escaped. I figured that would be the last time I would see him. I had no idea how wrong I was. I was home alone. My parents had gone grocery shopping and I preferred to stay at home playing video games in my room. Shortly after my parents left, I looked out the window out of curiosity and there he was. It was Mickey and again he was at the neighbor's window, looking at me and waving at me like the last time. I quickly reached for my cell phone to take a picture of him, but by the time I did, Mickey was gone. He had escaped me again and I'm sure no one would believe me when I told them I saw him again, which annoyed me even more. Anyway, I kept filming with my cell phone, hoping to find him escaping through the back or front door. I concentrated on zooming in on different parts of the house until a noise in my own house surprised me. The noise was coming from below me. I looked down at the camera, and there he was, Mickey. He was climbing my house. With superhuman strength, the man disguised as a mouse was climbing my house to get to my window. Something had changed about him. His body didn't look like it was a costume. He looked like he was a living thing. Plus, he no longer had the adorable Mickey look. His body was totally contracted, contorted, wrinkled, and deformed. I closed the window quickly and walked backward, terrified. Before I could react, Mickey was leaning out of my window, watching me. In an act of sheer violence, he smashed the window with a loud bang and burst into my room. There was something about him that I couldn't stop noticing. This Mickey didn't move like a, a human at all. It was as if he was trying to imitate a human, as if he was trying to look like Mickey, but behind him, there was no disguise. This was a completely different living being. Was it the one who killed my neighbors? I ran to the door, but to no avail. The terrifying monster caught up with me as I was coming to the end of the stairs, and we both fell down the stairs. I tried to get up and keep running, but I was in too much pain. Instead, Mickey got up without any problems, and after grabbing me by the hair, threw me against a piece of furniture. All the plates began to fall and break next to me, while Mickey, with total brutality, came in front of me and with his two huge hands began to choke me. I tried to beg for my life, tried to fight. I tried to cry. Nothing worked, and I was sure I would die there. Suddenly, the front door opened and my parents came in. My mom dropped all her bags and came running towards me. When I looked ahead again, trying to see my attacker's reaction, I was surprised. There was no one in front of me. Maybe it was too soon to let you go. I love him as much as you do, but this place isn't healthy for him. What do you mean? Where is the Mickey? We'll explain it to you, son. Get in the car. We have to go somewhere. After a sad and quiet trip where my parents were crying, we entered a hospital and a doctor greeted me. I didn't recognize the doctor, but he seemed to know me. He told me that he had been with me before, but that I would not remember anything, as I was suffering from a case of post-traumatic amnesia. With a lot of patience and confusion on my part, the doctor explained everything that was happening to me. As I told you before, my story did start with a crime, but not that of my neighbors, but that of my parents. One Thursday, I was coming home from school when I noticed that my parents had not received me. I heard strange noises in the room upstairs, and when I went to see what was happening, I saw my father dead 
and my mother dying. Next to her, there was a man dressed as Mickey. As soon as he saw me, the man lunged at me and started to choke me. But the police interceded, just in time. Do you know why? Because the neighbors saw everything through the window and called the police. After that, I spent some time in the hospital recovering from what happened. My neighbors were like parents to me, as they took care of me all their lives. While they were waiting for my parents' cousins to come and take care of me in a few months, they were going to take care of me. But I wasn't ready to see my old home, because even though the real man was behind bars, the demon I created in my head in the shape of Mickey was still stalking me, ready to take me, just like he had taken my parents. Today, I'm still trying to recover. I'm 20 years older, and from time to time I visit the neighbors who took care of me all my life. The house that used to be mine and my parents is inhabited by another family, which is probably for the best. It may have been a long time ago, but sometimes I still see Mickey waving at me from a window. I know it's all part of my imagination, so I just ignore it and go on with my life. There's an old saying that goes, You can take a person out of a place, but you can never take the place out of the person. And to be honest, that's exactly how I felt as I sat there and watched the peculiar scene play out before my very eyes. My name is Ethan Carter, and I used to be an FBI agent. I gave 13 years of my life to that job, and I loved every second of it. At the time, I thought I'd be an agent forever, as I had no plans for settling down, but that was before I met Alice, my wonderful wife. It didn't take long before we had a son, and I decided to retire so that I could spend more time with him. I more or less became a stay-at-home dad while my wife worked. And while I did some other jobs here and there on the side, I spent most of my time with my wonderful son, Matthew. Now that you're all caught up, this brings me back to the very beginning of the story where I reminded everyone of a very popular old saying. I thought of this saying while I sat in a nearby branch of the famous restaurant called Chuck E. Cheese with my son of the 12th of October, 2016. At that time, we had this tradition called Chuck E. Cheese Thursday, as my son loved the restaurant Chuck E. Cheese. So I had set out a day every week to take him there after school. And as we sat there, I noticed something very odd. Chuck E. Cheese, or as the children called him, Mr. Cheese, was acting in a very peculiar manner. Now to every normal gem in the restaurant, nothing was wrong, because to them, they just saw someone wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot costume and playing a character. But to a former FBI agent, I knew something was wrong with the person wearing the furry suit. For the 13 years of my life, I learned and mastered something called nonverbals, widely known as body language, during my time at the FBI. So I could tell a lot of things from a person's body movements, mannerisms, and the way they act, without having them say a single word. And as soon as I noticed those movements, my mind reverted back to a similar groove. As even though I was sitting in a Chuck E. Cheese restaurant, my mind acted as if I was back in the FBI. I watched as my seven-year-old Matthew ran up to him with excitement in his eyes, and I carefully studied their interactions. For starters, I noticed that the man inside the costume reacted the exact same way when he met every child. It was like a broken record, as he literally did the exact gestures perfectly. Now that wasn't what bothered me. No, what bothered me was how he acted in between intervals when he wasn't meeting any children. As immediately there weren't any children around, his whole body language changed. He pulled his legs behind him like he was extremely tired. The arched movements of his abdomen made it seem like he was having some difficulty breathing and any normal human being in that kind of situation could easily just go to the back and take a break. But he didn't. And it's not because he didn't want to. It was because he couldn't do it. All his body movements screamed that he was being forced to do this as he was literally a hostage walking in broad daylight. I was about to walk up to him to check and see if my intuition was true, but before I could reach him, he was ambushed by several kids and their parents asking to take pictures. My son then ran back into my arms with a yawn on his face. I could tell he was tired and it was time to go home. As we walked out of the restaurant, I stared directly at the man wearing the mascot and I gave him a huge smile as I told myself that I was surely going to find out whatever was going on with him. Next I returned. I went back the next day after dropping my son off from school. I ordered some food and I started observing the man wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot. As I watched him for a while, I began to notice a few things. For one, 
The manager watches the man wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot like a hawk. It was as if he was keeping him under surveillance. Another thing I noticed was that as soon as the man wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot stepped out of character or showed a bit of fatigue, the manager would shoot him a look of pure disgust and hatred. It didn't take long before I put two and two together. I knew something was going on, but I couldn't do anything about it yet, as I didn't have any proof. So I walked up to the man wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot, and I said, How's it going, Mr. Cheese? The man then looked at me and said, It's going great, friend. Have a wonderful day. And with that, he walked away. I stood there stunned because of what I had just heard. It was hard to tell because the muffled sound was coming out of the furry costume, but I could distinctively tell that what actually responded was a recording, as I was sure the man inside the costume didn't speak. Instead, he played a pre-recorded track as an answer. That was extremely strange, and I remember asking myself why he didn't just use his normal voice to answer instead of recording. I was still confused, but I carried out my next step. I walked up to the counter and asked for the manager. When he came out, I asked what his name was. The man then said, Christopher Harris, sir, with a huge smile on his face. I observed him and he seemed normal and kind, but I needed to see if my theory was correct. So I said, can I please ask a favor? You see, I have a seven-year-old son and he absolutely adores the person that plays Mr. Cheese in the restaurant. Is it possible if I could meet the man and ask if he would like to play the character at my son's birthday party at home? I promise I will pay him well. When I was done, I noticed that the manager's mood and mannerisms had changed as he began to stutter and give excuses like, I, I don't think he would be able to do that. You know, he's pretty shy and uh, he only wants to work here and maybe you could... As he continued to blubber out more lies, I noticed that his palms were sweaty now and his eyes were darting around the room like he was in trouble. All this further proved my point that there was something seriously shady going on and I was going to find out what. So I thanked him and told him that I'd find another person to do the job. I left the restaurant but I didn't leave the premises. I called my wife and told her to pick up our son from school as I wouldn't be able to make it home tonight. When I was done I entered my car and waited till it was evening. I stayed there till about 9 p.m. which was their closing hours. I saw all the employees leave one by one and soon enough everyone had come out except the manager and the man wearing the mascot. I waited till 10 o'clock before I finally saw them. I watched as the manager took the man wearing the Mr. Cheese mascot to a small storage unit behind the restaurant. They both went in and after 30 minutes only the manager came out. I watched as he locked the door with a padlock before going to his car and driving home. I was perplexed now as I wondered why a manager would be keeping one of his employees under lock and key. It began to seem like my suspicions were true, but I still needed a little more concrete proof. So I got out of the car and I made my way to the small storage unit building. I easily hacked the padlock as it was opened in less than six minutes. I then quietly opened the door and walked in. The rancid smell coming from the inside of the storage unit was horrible as it made my face scrounge up. The floor was wet as a washed Chuck E. Cheese mascot costume was dripping water all over the floor. As I walked further, my eyes darted all around the small room till eventually landed on a battered man lying in the corner. He was lying on a ragged mat with his back towards me so I couldn't see or make out his face. He was in a crouched position as there wasn't enough floor space for him to lie down freely. It was obvious that he had been brutally beaten in here as the bruises on his body were still fresh. My mind didn't have any explanation as to what was going on, so I tapped him to get some answers. Startled, the man turned around, and as soon as I saw his face, I was mortified. For starters, his face was swollen beyond recognition. Whoever had beaten him up clearly hated this man with a passion, but his disfigured face wasn't what horrified me. No, what made me horrified was the fact that his bloody mouth was sewn shut. I could see the infected, perforated holes on the top and bottom of his lips. I could also see the unimaginable pain on the man's disfigured face when he tried to open his mouth to talk. It took a while for my brain to process this ghastly scene, but I calmed myself down and I managed to calm the man down too. I tried to call someone for help, but the man shook his head vigorously as he didn't want me to do that. I then asked, did your boss do this to you? Because if he did, don't worry. I can get him thrown in jail for a very long time. 
Before I could finish, the men grabbed me by the shoulders and looked me dead in the eyes. No words were said as tears started rolling down the man's cheek, and from the deep fear in his eyes, I could tell that if I said anything to the cops about this, he would surely be killed. Luckily for me, I had been in situations similar to this so I knew exactly what I had to do. I calmly got up and said, It's alright, I understand. I won't tell anyone about this. You never saw me and I was never here. The look of relief in his eyes answered my statements as I slowly backed away towards the door of the storage unit. When I finally left, I didn't go home. I went back to my car to make some phone calls and when I was done, I waited for the manager. It was 1 p.m. when I finally made my move. I waited till the restaurant was filled with people as it was better that way. I walked in and I noticed the manager going to his office. So I quickly followed him and before he could enter his office, I confronted him. He immediately became nervous when he saw me as he said, Oh, it's you again, sir. Did you later find someone else to entertain the children at your son's birthday party? I didn't let him finish as I cut him off by saying, I know what you did. Confused, the manager said, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. I then looked him dead in the eyes and said, I know everything that you've done to the man wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot outside. I've already called the cops, so they'll be here any minute now. But before they drag you away, I would like to ask one question. Why? What did the man ever do to deserve that? A sick grin was now plastered all over the manager's face as he said, Your feeble mind can never understand why. I had a duty to perfectly bring that character to life. I needed that man to be one with Chuck, and I was going to do anything to make sure that he was, regardless of what I had to do to him. He had to be as perfect as John Weidler and Scott Wilson. These men gave that character life when the Chuck E. Cheese mascot was first introduced. They did it magically as I was amazed by their performance when I was a child. So when I was given the opportunity to be the manager, I swore to reproduce that magic, no matter what it did. After blubbering complete nonsense for the past few minutes, he then looked me dead in the eyes and said, I had to do it for the children. It was all for the children and I don't regret it. When he was done, I didn't need anyone to tell me that this man had been playing an act in public. The mask he carried around was finally off and I came to realize that deep down he was nothing but a messed up psychopath. I had dealt with people like this before so I knew exactly what came next after their psychotic breakdown. I watched as he bolted to the forefront of the restaurant with a tense look on his face. Seeing as I knew how his mind worked, I already predicted that he was going to grab a kid so I quickly tackled him before he managed to do that and within minutes, we were all surrounded by cops. Investigations were quickly carried out, and soon enough, everything was brought to light. The abused man, after he had been taken to the hospital and cleaned up, was identified as Jose Hernandez, a 19-year-old illegal Mexican immigrant. Around two years ago, he had managed to cross the dangerous U.S. border, but his father was shot in the process, and he was eventually separated from his mother. Jose then started to explain how everything happened as he said, the last thing I was told about my mother was that she was either captured or killed. And I soon came to terms with the fact that my mother was dead now too, which made me an orphan in a foreign land. After grieving the loss of my parents, I traversed many areas on the street looking for jobs so I could make some money to eat. And that's when I met the man called Christopher Harris, as he found me on the side of the road. Jose told us the manager had picked him up from the side of the road under the lure of having a job for him. He then told us, how things went from there saying, During the first few weeks of the job, Mr. Christopher began to brutally groom me into becoming the character Chuck E. Cheese. He explained how the manager hated his voice because of his Mexican accent, as Mr. Harris really hated it whenever he spoke in the Chuck E. Cheese costume. Apparently, Mr. Christopher believed he was unfit to be the voice of Chuck, so he gave him generic pre-recorded messages to play any time he was confronted by customers and children. Jose then told us, even after I was given the recorded messages, I still found it hard not to speak when spoken to, as I still used my voice from time to time. Through tears, he then explained how the manager truly hated this, as he said. Mr. Christopher really hated it when I did that, and in order to put a stop to it, my mouth was morbidly sewn shut. And the threads were only removed when it was time for me to feed. Jose told us the constant, ghastly act of repeatedly sewing and loosening his mouth 
had made him lose almost all sensation in his lips before continuing with, No matter what was done to me, I knew that I couldn't go to the police because being an illegal immigrant with no papers made sure that it wasn't an option. No one needed to tell me that I couldn't do anything about the morbid way I was being treated, so I had no choice but to bury him. He then revealed that after a while, to his surprise, he found out his mother was still alive and she had managed to contact him. I remember when I told Mr. Christopher the good news, he started to beat me mercilessly. He did this because the apparent backstory of the Chuck E. Cheese character stated that Chuck E. Cheese was an orphan, and now that my mother was alive, I wasn't able to truly become the character. He said Mr. Christopher hated unfixable imperfections when playing the Chuck E. Cheese character, so he threatened to replace him as he was now unfit to be the character. Apparently, Mr. Christopher had told him the week before that he was already looking for replacements along the border, and once he had found a suitable person, he promised Jose that he would get rid of him. Jose then finally said that if it wasn't for me finding him, he would most likely be dead now. After the police finished questioning the abused victim, more investigations were carried out and it was revealed that Jose wasn't the first person to undergo the messed up brutal method acting that Christopher Harris put him through. When asked what he did with the rest of them, the manager confessed that most of them died due to the brutal treatment that they were put through. And in order to dispose of them, he took their bodies upstate to a family-owned farm and fed their remains to pigs as that was the best way to leave no trace. The farm was searched by forensics and small remnants, traces of over eight victims were found but it was impossible to identify any one of them. At the end of the trial, when the case was coming to a close, the psychopath Christopher Harris was given life imprisonment. As he told his lawyer, he didn't want to plead insanity. After the buzz of the case had simmered down, I pulled some strings with some of my friends in immigration, and with a good lawyer, I managed to get Jose to stay in the United States, and I also made sure that he was eventually reunited with his mother. I normally visit them every now and then just to see how they're doing. Over six years have passed since all this happened, and to be honest, this incident made me see family-oriented places and restaurants in a different light, as these places were where we bring kids and families to have fun and put smiles on their faces. And as a parent, never in a million years would I have ever thought that a place like that would also be a treading ground for a deranged psychopath. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that we should all be careful out there because truly evil people look just like rest of us. If you're enjoying this content, make sure you like and subscribe.